This morning's scripture reading is, is uh, Hebrews 11, 8 through 21. That's Hebrews 11, 8 through 21. By faith, Abraham, when called to go to a place he would later receive as his inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. By faith, he made his home in the promised land, like a stranger in a foreign country. He lived in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob, who were heirs with him in the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city with foundations, whose architect and builder is God. And by faith, even Sarah, who was past childbearing age, was enabled to bear children, because she considered him faithful, who had made him, who had made the promise. And so from this one man, and he as good as dead, came descendants, descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky, and as countless as the sand on the seashore. All these people were still living by faith when they died. They did not receive the things promised. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance, admitting that they were foreigners and strangers on earth. People who say such things show that they are looking for a country of their own. If they had been thinking of the country they had left, they would have had opportunity to return. Instead, they were longing for a better country, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. By faith, Abraham, when God tested him, offered Isaac as a sacrifice. Few had embraced the promise of was about to sacrifice his one and only son, even though God had said to him, It is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. Abraham reasoned that God could even raise the dead, and in, in so in the matter of speaking, he did not receive Isaac back from the dead. By faith, Isaac blessed Jacob and Esau in regard to their future. By faith, Jacob, when he was dying, blessed each of Joseph's son and worshiped as he leaned on the top of his staff. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word. I hope you've had a good Thanksgiving. When you think of Thanksgiving, I uh, don't know what you think of first. I happen to love turkey, stuffing, and potatoes, so that's what my mind goes to first. Uh, my mom knew how to make those. She made them many times for church suppers and for grain suppers, and we just always had that food available to us. But it's something special about eating it on Thanksgiving. Then I also think about getting together with family. The opportunities we have to see people that we don't always get a chance to see and maybe meet some new people along the way. And then I am convicted to realize it usually takes me food, family, before I remember it's a, it's a holiday about thanking God. We're thanking God. Even if the food isn't there, even if the family isn't there, God is there. And I think about those that don't have the provisions to really enjoy a a good Thanksgiving meal. I, I heard that, I, I know I was listening to the radio at one point, Allentown Rescue Mission was very low on the turkeys that they were receiving. They weren't sure what they would be able to provide for the people down there. I think about those that were not able to get with, together with all the family that they had hoped to. We had some sickness in our house and it changed our plans. Um, I actually had a little bit of a, a post-traumatic stress uh, remembrance of 2020 because Matthew was away on vacation and the secretary got sick that's why there's certain things missing in the church <coughs> and that she, it's not her fault it's mine um, but just coming into an empty church I remember doing that for a long much too long during 2020 now there were other people that stopped by and it was a blessing to see them just to recognize that God is still God whether it was two years ago or this week. Um, I wish I would have read the Daily Bread the day of Thanksgiving. If you saw it, the verse was, Hope deferred makes the heart sick. And I was, I was pretty punchy throughout the week. And matter of fact, uh, before Wednesday night, I wrote the elders and said, If anything goes wrong tonight, I don't think I can handle it. So could somebody take over? And one said, I will be there. And he was. And, only one thing went wrong, and I did it was able to handle it, but the technology and all that stuff. I just, why am I so punchy? Because hope deferred. I was looking forward to seeing my family. My wife wasn't able to come. Um, 
looking forward to, to just having the time that we didn't have two years ago with my family. This time, and there was still sickness involved. Then I began asking myself, what is it that I'm hoping for? I'm hoping for the food, I've already said that. The food happened, I'm hoping for some family, there were family. We went to my brother's house, he had two uh, 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 pe disabled people that they ministered to come. It was great to kind of celebrate along with them. And two friends of theirs, one I worked with camp for many summers when I was in college, it was neat to see them. And then of course, nephews and nieces of my sister and my brother and their, their families as well. But it's about God. Hope deferred makes the heart sick. My hope is in the Lord. If my hope is in the Lord, I can always have the healing to my sick soul. God can always provide that healing. And that's what we should look for. So as I think about what is it that we really hope for, that makes a good transition question to the, the season of Advent. Advent, to some people, think that there's no place in an evangelical church. That's more of a liturgical church and some of the liberal churches. That's what they do. There's nothing wrong with Advent. It is a beautiful picture. It's a, a good reminder that we're preparing ourselves for Christmas as it's on its way. In fact, some have called Advent a little Lent. If you think about Ash Wednesday and Lent leading into Easter, preparing yourself for the celebration uh, of the sacrifice of Jesus and the resurrection. So this is, usually Advent is more upbeat. Uh, Lent can be more of a, of a fasting and things like that. But, but the fact is, it's a way to prepare. And it's the four weeks before Christmas. Christmas Eve is actually the last day of Advent. We celebrate the lighting of the middle candle, the Christ candle on Christmas Eve. Now, we've had candles here. I didn't have... The desire to figure that all out this year so i'll just show this picture each week um advent means arrival and it the, the arrival of the son of god the first advent of jesus the incarnation when god became man that is worth celebrating the wreath is green which suggests life and it's a circle suggesting eternal life it goes on and it goes on and on we use candles because we know that Jesus is the light of the world. Now, I didn't realize this until just a couple of years ago. Uh, three of the candles are usually blue or purple, suggesting royalty, the coming of the king. And the third or fourth Sunday, whichever way they set it up, is usually rose or pink um, to, to just celebrate joy. Now, I'm not using the traditional themes for Advent. I'll explain in a moment what I'm doing, but I, I do know that everything I read, whenever I'm looking, what's the possible themes for the four weeks? Uh, the first one is always hope. The first candle is always about hope. And as I'm not using those traditional themes, I already explained, we're going to be looking at the genealogy of Jesus Christ in the first chapter of Matthew. And we're going to look at the names of generations of people they lead us to the hope of the Messiah coming. That's where we are. And, and to, to know that we're going to look at that genealogy, let me read the first two verses of Matthew chapter 1. The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, he's a king. The son of Abraham, he's a Jew. And the first four names there, Abraham was the father, the first three names, Abraham was the father of Isaac, and Isaac the father of Jacob, and then Jacob the father of Judah and all of his brothers. Now, I added Sarah to this message because she's a very interesting uh, character. Are you enjoying watching Christmas movies yet? I mean, that one station starts them at Halloween. You just they judge them. Whether you want to see them or not, they're there. What makes a good story is to understand the character development behind the people. It's hard to do in an hour or two hour show to get to know what a character is, what makes them tick. Well, today I'm going to be talking about these four characters, um, Abraham, Sarah, Isaac, and Jacob. And I want to develop their character just a little bit. Well, we don't have that much time, but if you're familiar with these stories in the Old Testament, God gives us this whole story of this family and that the king line and all the things that lead to the coming of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, 
becoming man. And the more we understand the backstory, the more we can appreciate what is really happening. So that's our season of Advent. You've already heard me say today is a time for family. Next week will be a time for the needy. That's why we ring bells for Salvation Army. That's why we give at our Benevolence Committee at Thanksgiving and Christmas give out gifts and takes care of those that might not have. Uh, then it's also a time for sinners. David, we'll look at the story of David. He was a man after God's own heart, but he was a sinner. And then a time for waiting. All the generations that followed, the time of the kings and the prophets and just waiting for the one who was to come. So that's where we're going this month, uh, these next four weeks. My proposition today is this. The advent of Jesus is for all people. It's not just for Western people. I love the fact that Matthew includes the coming of the men from the East. You don't see much about the people from the East in the Bible, but God was very aware of them, and he gave them a sign, and they came and were part of it. All people, Muslim countries, I don't know if you're watching the, the World Cup, uh, to think about all the things that are happening in that country, a little bit different than maybe other countries where they hosted it before. But God sent his son, Jesus came for all people. And I want to look at these four people and recognize that they, are, they were lost, just as we are lost, and all people are lost. Jesus came to save and to save that which was lost. And I hope this encourages us today, this first Sunday of Advent, that we find the hope that God can work through anybody. Father, I pray that you bless us as we look into your word, we look at these people, um, not always good to talk about people. We can get into gossip mode, but the fact is you've told the stories of these unique individuals, and yet as we look at them, we can also see ourselves and see people that are like that in our own lives. Help us to remember whatever our story is, whatever our backstory is, you came for us. And it's not until we recognize the Savior of the world that he loves us, that you love us, that we can find the, the true hope that you want your creation to have. It will only be extended to your family, those that come to you by faith. I pray that we can see that. I pray that you'll have mercy and be a sinner, that nothing I ever say will hinder what you want us to see in your word today. Bless us to know you, to know our loved ones, to know ourselves, to know that you have a plan. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The advent of Jesus is for all people. The first person we see in this genealogy is Abraham. And Abraham is mentioned not just as he's as a key person, the son of David, the son of Abraham, and he starts then with Abraham. When I see the story of Abraham, you can start reading it, actually at the end of Genesis 11, but you can read through Genesis 12 all the way through Genesis 25. It's a very interesting story is in there. I'm going to try to point out the chapters that relate to the things I'm pointing out now uh, for each of these points. The first thing that I want you to see about Abraham is he was obedient. He was an obedient man. I'm calling him the righteous. Let me be clear. He wasn't righteous because he was obedient. He was righteous for another reason. But the first thing we see about Abraham is he's obedient. God promises him some, a number of promises at the beginning of Genesis 12. And in chapter 4, the first, verse, first part of the verse, it says, So Abram went as the Lord had told him. He said, You go to a land that I will show you. And Abram got up and left. He followed. With me, if I'm, because Nancy was sick, I had to drive to my brothers on my own. I don't do long trips as much anymore. I had the GPS on. I had Google Maps on. I laid it all out to know which places I was going to do this and what I wasn't going to do. I want to know where I'm headed. Abram just left. He didn't know where he was going, but he knew who had asked him to come, and he was willing to follow God. So, so he's obedient. And then in chapter 22, he was obedient to the point where God said, after waiting for a long time to have a son, he has the son, and God says, I want you to offer your son as a sacrifice to me. And in Genesis 22, verse 3, if I was asked to do something hard, I would procrastinate and drag my feet as long as I possibly could. 
But in Genesis 22, 3, it says, So Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey, took two of his young men with him and his son Isaac, and he cut the wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place of which God had told him. He obeyed. That's a great trait, especially when you're obeying right then. It's a good when you follow orders, when, when you follow the commands of God. But I'll say that didn't make Abraham righteous. We'll see in a moment what makes him righteous. So Abraham, the righteous, he was obedient. We also see that Abraham, the righteous, was fearful. Was fearful. In Genesis 12, toward the end, the second half of the chapter, Abraham is traveling. He has to go to Egypt. He has to go to Egypt because the food's not available, so he's going down to Egypt, even though he's been promised the land. He's not really condemned for doing this. He should be condemned for what he's about to do. Genesis 12, 11 through 13 says this. When he, Abraham, was about to enter to Egypt, he said to Sarah, his wife, I know that you are a woman beautiful in appearance. Good job. That's good. Compliment your wife. And when the Egyptians see you, they will say, this is his wife. Then they will kill me, but they will let you live. Say you are my sister, that it may go well with me because of you, and may my life, that my life may be spared for your sake. That's a pretty tough ask. Because what's he's afraid of? They're going to take her. And when he says that she's my sister, that's exactly what happened. Pharaoh took her into his harem. And before he could sin against her, before he could do anything, sickness came to the house. And Pharaoh was told why. Because Abraham was chosen of God, and that's his wife. And he sent her back to Abraham. That's just a terrible story. When you read the Old Testament pertaining to women, there's a lot of ter terrible stories. But this is the righteous Abraham. And he did that to his wife. And then when you get over the fact that he did it once, he did it twice. At the end of his life, I don't know how gorgeous this woman was, because even when she was old, he was still afraid that he was going to get murdered so someone could have her as their wife. A man named Abimelech, he said, let's do that again. I don't know that it says the second time that he had a conversation with her. I think he just did it. He was fearful. How many stupid things do we do when we are fearful? Again, Abimelech took her into his house, and before anything could happen, God protected her. And, and Abimelech said, you sent her home. And he did. Now why could this man be so afraid that something would happen to him and say, well, I hope she'll be taken care of, but I won't be killed. Think about what he might be condemning her to do. And he did it twice. If you have enough faith to believe, well, God protect her, why don't you just say, God protect me? Why don't you just not put her into that place? But he did it twice. So Abraham the righteous was obedient. Good. Abraham the righteous was fearful. And he did something awful twice. He was also brave. Well, that's contradictory. Is he fearful or is he brave? Yes. Because when his nephew Lot, who had moved in around Sodom and Gomorrah, when they were attacked and carried off, Abraham took a group of about 300 plus men and he went and he rescued Lot and the people of Sodom and Gomorrah, and he won a victory to return them, to bring them back with great spoil. It's not like they just snuck in and got them. They won a victory. So he was brave enough to, to win that victory. That happens in Genesis 14. A side note, because I'm a preacher, and you got to always point this out whenever you see it. Um, it's at that time that tithing was first introduced, before the law, well before the law. When he was, came back in victory, Melchizedek, a priest of Midian, met him, and in honor to what God had done, he gave a tenth of all the spoils to Melchizedek. That was the beginning of that. So, Abraham the righteous is obedient, he's fearful, he's also brave. But the, the defining statement about Abraham is found in Genesis 15, 6. We're going to read it together in a moment. We'll get there in a second. But I want to say a few things first. Abraham the righteous was also doubtful. At the beginning of chapter 15, God visits Abraham again and makes the promises. And Abraham says, okay, God, you keep saying that. 
but I have no heir. If I died right now, someone, one of my servants, would be the heir of my household. You promised me many descendants, nothing. And he does this later when he has Ishmael. And he said, just accept Ishmael, because he, he just, he has his doubts. He is a great man of faith, but he is full of doubt as well. And I think we have to understand that. Because what makes a person righteous is faith. Righteousness comes through faith. Now let's read that verse together. Genesis 15, 6. Genesis 15, 6. Let's read it together. And Abraham believed the Lord, and he counted it to him as righteousness. God is counting to Abraham righteousness because of his faith. That verse is so important, it's quoted four times in the New Testament. Twice in Romans, once in Galatians, and once by James, the half-brother of Jesus. His epistle. The righteous will live by faith. We are counted righteous because of our faith. The scripture reading that Ed read, read was, was about our faith, the hall of faith. It is by faith that we please God. We trust God for things that we cannot see. So that's the first thing I want you to see. That's a good foundation, a character for the whole story of redemption. That it is by faith that we receive righteousness. Now, when you got together with your family or when you get together with family, I want you to think for a moment, who's the righteous one in the family? Usually there's someone in the family that's the conscience. When I grew up, it was my mom's mom, my grandma. She was a, she was a, a gracious woman, but she's the one that you always felt like, you'd be good, you'd be good. My other grandmother, her name was Mama, we called her Mama. She was always smiling, always laughing. I loved them both. There were, and she was a godly woman as well. She just didn't quite come across the same way as Grandma. And, and now, of course, I'm a pastor. Whatever room I'm in, they look at me and say, well, you must be the righteous one in this room. <laughs> oh, if they only do. <laughs> if they only do. Abraham the righteous. Do you feel that you could be righteous? You can. Not because of your obedience. Not because... You're so afraid that God is going to zap you that you're going to do the right thing. Not because you're brave, not because of your doubts, but when you overcome those doubts with faith, God calls you righteous. That's a great way, great place to begin as we go into Advent. That's the reason Jesus came as the Son of God, to seek those that were lost and make them righteous. Now, we're going to turn to Abraham's wife, Sarah. And this is not I don't want to sound at all chauvinistic or anything. It's the only woman I'm going to talk about in this story. There's a number of women next week we're going to talk about. I'm just going to just call her complex. I would admit in college, men would sit in the dorm room and talk about how confused we were about the women that we knew. But we're all complex. I'm not saying it's just women. But when I see her story, there's some things that you need to see. Um, She's submissive. She was a submissive wife. When Abraham came home and said, Hey, honey, we're moving. Where are we going? I don't know. She went right along with him. And we've already talked about the two times that he said, By the way, I want to call you my sister because I'm afraid for my neck. And she submitted to that. One of the things that we read in, in books today, and it's, we have to be careful. This Christian submissive wife, it, it's true, it's in the Bible, but it can be taken in the wrong way. And I've seen men use the Bible to hold things over their wives. They have no business. They're not righteous men. They're not acting in faith. So it's good that she's submissive. That's a good place to begin. But then let's contradict that. And she, she, she was also insistent. There were times in life when she said, she put her foot down, and said, this is what I want. And Abraham being a good husband said, uh-huh. When she saw that she was not giving Abraham a son, she said, I have a, a servant. She's an Egyptian. Her name is Hagar. I want you to have a son with her, Abraham, and that will be my, that will be called my son. <coughs> I don't know how much she had to insist, but Abraham went along. But then, 
when Hagar gave birth to a boy named Ishmael, or before she gave birth, when she saw that she was pregnant, Hagar started to feel like that. She was called a wife, not just a concubine, she was called a wife. I'm the wife that's bearing a son. I'm the wife that's bearing a child for Abraham. She couldn't, and she despised Sarah. And they began to have problems. Sarah didn't like it, went to Abraham. What am I supposed to do? And he said, you're, you're a servant, do whatever you want. She mistreated her and Hagar ran. But God met Hagar and said, you go back and submit to your mistress. Submit to Sarah. And she did. But then after Sarah had her child, Isaac, now you've got some sibling rivalry going on. With two moms fighting over who's the most important, who's going to win in this case. And Ishmael probably was a jerk of an older brother like older brothers could be sometimes. And Sarah saw it and she insisted that he and the mother leave. Abraham said, okay, and sent them on their way. So this very submissive woman in some cases could be very insistent in other ways. That's why I call her complex. Very rarely are we just one thing. True. We are many things. We are many things. And then just one more about her. She was disingenuous. Sarah was disingenuous. Because in Genesis chapter 18, God visits Abraham, this was before Isaac was born, and says, in a year you'll have a son, and you will name him Isaac. She was listening, and she laughed. God knew she laughed. God confronted her and said, why did you laugh? And she said, I didn't laugh. Yes, you did. I don't know if she was lying to herself or just lying to other people, but people that are disingenuous can be disingenuous with their own they don't even know themselves let alone how they're projecting themselves i can't admit that i laugh i can't admit that there's something wrong you have family members that are like that they can't ever admit that there's something wrong it's a horrible place to be because until you see what's wrong you can't see what god wants to do to make it right we have to be honest about our our frailties yes i'm a good submissive person no i'm an insistent person i'm an I'm complex. We all are complex. And God came to seek and to save us. We are only righteous because of faith. We are all complex because he created us. God is not just one thing. He's great study. Just look at his attributes. He is many things. We are made in his image. We are many things. Unfortunately, those many things have been marred by sin. And that can make it all more difficult to understand who we are. So we have Abraham the righteous, we have Sarah the complex. Now let's go to the son. The son, Isaac. I'm calling him the people pleaser. He's the one that just whatever, I'm going to make, I'm just going to go along with whatever. And I'm just going to make three statements uh, that, that I think Isaac, whether he formed them in his mind, it's the way he acted. First statement, okay, Dad, you can kill me. You can sacrifice me. I'm down with that. Chapter 22, when God said to Abraham, take your son. Isaac submitted and went. The picture that I put in the slideshow shows Abraham covering his eyes with his hands up and he's ready to stab him so he doesn't see when the, when the knife is coming down. And we know that God never intended for Isaac to die. And it said in Hebrews 11, Abraham said, this is the child of promise. If I kill him, God must have a plan to raise him from the dead. Huh, that sounds like foreshadowing of the redemption story. But he didn't have to kill Isaac. God stopped him. It was just something for us to learn, for something for Abraham to learn. So, the people pleasers, even if I have to break, even if I have to sacrifice much, I'll just go along. I'll just go along. The next thing we see, okay, Dad, you can find me a wife. That's in Genesis 24. That wasn't unheard of in that day, many arranged marriages. But when you see the whole story, he's just passively like, oh, I guess that's going to be my wife. And he just kind of lets her, takes her into his house, has children by her. He's just, he's just a passive, just whatever. Do you know people like that when you get together? 
They'll be talking to one person on this side of the house and they go along there and they, over here it's the other side of the house. I don't know if they're separated on purpose, but something different and they'll go along there and the contradictions are many. Because when you start finding people, one of the things that happened this week is I was trying to stay away from my wife so I didn't get sick so I could go to Thanksgiving so I could see my family. And so I slept out in the TV room and whenever I needed to move from the couch to my chair, whenever I was trying to find a way to be comfortable, I would turn the TV on as a nightlight. Middle of the night, I turned the TV on and Julius Caesar was playing. Shakespeare's version. I remember studying that in high school and not realizing all the things that were great to see. And it was right at the point, I recorded it, I didn't watch it then, I turned it off. And I got up the next day and watched it. If you're familiar with the story, after the Senate had killed Caesar, they now have to win the crowd. They have to win the crowd. And Brutus is the man who said, I will go win the crowd. I will speak to them. But then Mark Antony, who was very loyal to Caesar, they gave him permission to speak. And the only thing they said was, don't you speak ill of the Senate. Don't you speak bad about us. So Brutus gets out to the people and they're ready to say, what did you do? And he, by the time he's gone, done, the whole crowd, yes, it needed to be done. Caesar had to die. Then Antony comes out in a great speech. He starts to talk about Caesar and they start to feel more towards Caesar. And he never once says anything bad about them. In fact, he says, ah, but Brutus is an honorable man. He repeats that over and over again. But by the time he is done, the crowd is ready to kill the Senate and they have to flee. You think our politics today are tough? And it makes me think that our politics today are less and less about people in honor having a discussion together, but rather whipping the mob into a frenzy. We need to pray. We need to pray. Because that is so easy to do. You see it around you all the time. Things that people should know better, but you get the right message and, and you, you, you're able to, to squelch other messages. People will fall for it every time. So I think about that because in general, we don't want to make trouble unless there's a real reason to. We're, we want to be people pleasers. The last statement that I'll say about Isaac is this. Okay, Rebecca, I'll bless Jacob. Isaac wanted to bless Esau. Esau was a twin to Jacob. Esau came out of the womb first. We'll talk about that in a moment. So if, if they have favorites and they had favorites, Isaac wanted to bless Esau. Rebecca, the mom, wanted Jacob to get the blessing. And she has Jacob put things on his arm so he seems hairy because Esau was hairy and Jacob was not. By the way, Isaac lost his sight at this point. He also has, uh, she also has Jacob wear Esau's clothes so he smells like Esau. So Jacob goes and presents something that he says he killed in the field who was just one of the lambs from his flock. And he presents it to his father, and his father says, the voice is Jacob. But he calls him close and he touches his arm, but the hands are Esau. He knew something was up. And then just before he announces the blessing, he pulls him in one more time just to get a good whip of To get a good smell. Ah, the, the clothing. That's that's my son Esau. So even though he had his doubts, he just went along with what was presented to him and he blessed Jacob over Esau. Again, do you know people pleasers in your life? Don't take advantage of them. It's cruel. Help them to see the need to stand for truth, not just whatever the crowd says. Abraham the righteous, Sarah the complex, and Isaac, the people pleaser, application for this point is we are called to please God first. That's whose pleasure we should always be looking for. The last one, probably one of my favorite characters on a negative side is Jacob, the manipulator. Jacob is the one who would seek to manipulate everything. You don't do that kind of thing, do you? Make things work out the way you want them to work out in any way that you see 
possible. The first thing we learn about Jacob in Genesis 25 is that he wrestled with his brother in the womb. And when Esau came out, Jacob was grabbing his heel and said, no, I want to be first. He wrestled with his brother. Then we already talked about he deceived his father. He had his mom's help. But I don't think he could blame it on the mommy. This is the kind of person he wanted to be. He was going to make life work for him no matter what. And he deceived his father and, and took the blessing. We didn't even talk about tricking his, his brother to, to give up the birthright. He's a manipulator. And then I love when the manipulator meets another manipulator. After, after tricking um, his dad to bless him over Esau, Esau wanted to kill him. So Jacob had to leave. He had to flee. And he was sent to his mother's house where Laban, his uncle, was. And he began serving Laban. Laban had two daughters. He was in love with the younger, Rachel. And he said, I will work seven years for her. And when the time came for them to be married, I don't know how this happened, <laughs> but it happened. He woke up the next day and he was married to Laban. And then he said, okay, seven more years and you can have Rachel as well. So the trickster, the manipulator, was manipulated to marry both daughters. Again, these aren't the best of stories. But the fact is we all try to make things work for ourselves and sometimes it doesn't work out. But I say here, he did finally best his father-in-law. He bested his father-in-law. Because after he had worked for 14 years for his two wives, he said, okay, now I need to build up my own flock. And he made agreements with Laban, and he said, I'll take all the spotted ones, or I'll take all this kind. Now, and every time he made an agreement, God worked it out. There's things that it says that he does. I don't know what that had to do with it, if it actually made scientific sense. But whatever happened, his flocks increased. And it was easy because they were all marked the right way. And so then Laban wasn't penniless, but he got a lot. Of Laban's flocks because of his work there. So he bested his father in law, who tricked him first, but then he came away a very rich man. <clears throat> the last part of his story is probably the best in my mind. He's going back to meet his brother Esau. Esau wanted to kill him. He's afraid. He sends all kinds of gifts to, to meet Esau to kind of help him say, Yes, please don't kill me. Please don't kill me. You can just see each gift. But the night before he was to meet Esau, he separated himself from his camp, and he was alone. And the angel of the Lord came, and I believe that angel of the Lord is Jesus Christ himself. And they wrestled. Jacob wrestled with Jesus. Chapter 32, it's great. And they wrestled all night. And finally, the angel of the Lord said, let me go. And he said, I won't let you go until you bless me. That's the place where Jesus touched his hip and knocked it out of its socket. And that was, there's all kinds of story there to read if you want to read it. I will not let you go until you bless me. With all the manipulating we do in life, when do we finally turn to the Lord and say, I'm holding on to you. Not what I can achieve, but what you want to do in me. That I'm going to stop being the trickster, the deceiver. I'm going to do things your way. I see that you're the one that I trust. <laughs> and the, the application that I would say here is that whatever we do, we cannot stop God's plan. It is not possible. We may derail a little bit, but only by God's permission. I love to tell people when they come and they ask, I really did something awful. And I said, be sure of this. God's will for your life included your bad decisions. He just knows. <coughs> and he has a plan. God's will for this world included Genesis 3. God's will includes the need to send a Savior to save sinners, to find and to seek and to save the lost. It's all part of God's will, God's plan. So we have four interesting people that we've looked at this morning. They're, they're, they're better than any character on any movie you're watching this season. There's, a, there's stories here, and I haven't even begun to get into all of it. And only what God has revealed, and even then it's still hard to understand. What exactly happened here? 
Abraham the righteous, <coughs> Sarah the complex, Isaac the passive people pleaser, and Jacob the manipulator. Who do you identify with most? Think about that for a second. Which is most like you? Let me remind you, they're all, we are like all of them at some point in our lives. All of these things can be true of us. And that's where my conclusion is. <laughs> Jesus came to seek and save the lost. Jesus came to redeem us. He came to save us. We are all manipulative at some point. When we're afraid and we're trying to preserve something that we want to protect, we will do whatever it takes. We are manipulative. We are all susceptible to peer pressure. Take the easy way. I don't, this is not a, it's not a battle I want to fight right now. I know when I was with uh, my, my brother's family, there was a, a person on the side of his family. They kept dropping uh, hints about wanting to talk about politics. I just not was, I wasn't up for it. I think I've agreed with him on just about everything, but I just didn't want to get into it because there'll be somebody across the room that doesn't agree. And I didn't want to, you know, see, you kind of, you go along, but well, no, you don't go along. We're all tempted. We're all susceptible to peer pressure when it comes. We are all complex. Do you surprise yourself at times at how you're reacting to something? I thought I was done with that. I, I jokingly said post-traumatic stress disorder when I was coming in, I was the only one here in the church, and just uh, reminded me too much of a really tough time two years ago. And then somebody stopped by and we talked some football, felt much better. We are all complex. And the last statement, we all can be righteous, not because we're obedient or because we're afraid of God, therefore we're going to do whatever he says, because we believe God. We all can be righteous by faith in Jesus Christ. I hope that this Christmas season, you do not only see that for yourself, but you would see it for everyone else that you know. This is a time of great difficulty in our country. People have rejected God and his ways in so many ways. Love them. Try to show them not what you're against, but what you were, but what you were for. Because there is hope. There is hope to be found only in Jesus Christ. I have no hope for the next Congress. I have no hope for the next two years of this president or the following president. I've been disappointed enough. Disney just got a new person in charge. I have no hope for that either. My hope is in the Lord. And as we celebrate his first advent, we look forward to the second advent when he comes and he brings true peace to this world. Let's pray. Father, I thank you. I thank you for your, your love and your care. I thank you for the story that we have in the scriptures and we can study it from now to eternity and still not glean everything that there is to be gleaned and we only have in the scriptures what you've revealed there's so much more about you god that we don't even know that, that we can't understand and even the stuff that's in here we can claim to understand it but we twist it and make it fit our image instead of really seeking to know you and your image help us to know that through it all you're seeking us Help us to know that even though we doubt, even though we struggle, even though we manipulate, even though we go along with people we shouldn't go along with, whatever it is that we're doing, I pray that we would, that we would know that you understand us. You understand the complexities of what it is to be a human being. And we pray that you would help us to see you, first of all, as Savior, and then see you as the one who gave the gift of the Spirit to guide us through this life. If there's anyone here, Lord, that doesn't yet know you as Savior, that doesn't recognize that they have to be honest about being a sinner and being lost, but when they confess that to you and turn to you as the only Savior of the world, you will come into their lives and you will bring them salvation. You will bring them the hope that they think that they have in other things of this world. It is the only hope that will satisfy. But it will be difficult because we wait for the day when this earth will be made new, and in the new heaven and the new earth, we will live with you in glory. Help us to come to you by faith and to grow in our righteousness. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Number 244, Come Thou Long Expected Jesus. Let's stand as we sing. <laughs> And now, peace to you, brothers and sisters, and love with faith from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be to all who love our Lord Jesus Christ with an undying love. Amen. Amen. 